Hello and welcome to Soothing Pond's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a calming train journey through the enchanting scenery of the late Cretaceous period. We will safely ride alongside dinosaurs as they roam the wild and wonderful landscape. We will learn about their habits, biology, and fossils, all the while while we enjoy the comforts of our lush and fabulous train compartment. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations, there are no responsibilities. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are slowly relaxing and providing your body and mind with the rest and nourishment that they need. Sleep will come in due time, but know that your mind and body are already on a soothing journey of peace and relaxation. Allow your body to sink more and more into the mattress beneath you, really feeling the comfort and support of the bed. Notice how it cradles your body and notice the parts of your body that are in contact with the bed. Your legs, arms, your torso, your head as it presses into the soft pillow or the mattress itself. For a moment, let us imagine that you're not in your room. Instead, you find yourself somewhere else entirely. Somewhere that is beautiful and vibrant and relaxing. You're deep within a peaceful jungle, miles and miles away from society, where you can just unwind and watch the entirely unique world around you breathe and move. The jungle is thick and lush, with an abundance of plants that stretch as far as the eye can see. It's the middle of the day, and the sun is high and reaching its crest in the baby blue sky overhead. You can only see slivers of the blue popping in between slits in the leafy canopy. Slivers that contrast beautifully against the green branches in the canopy, making them look like islands floating on a tranquil turquoise sea. The branches overhead sway and dance in the light breeze, a breeze that is fragrant with aromas that you have never smelled before. They are earthy and fresh, like soil and loam and ferns, mixed with a sweet fragrance of flowers that invoke its ethereal beauty and mystery. You breathe it in as it laces through the forest, somehow becoming more and more invigorating with every deep breath you drink in. The flowers and trees around you are familiar. 
but just a bit different than the plants you'd expect to find in rainforests around the world. There are endless oceans of fern blanketing the clearing. The ferns sway with every gust of wind, moving in unison like waves moving across the sea. Their rippling in the breeze makes the whole space feel as though it's alive, breathing in harmony with you and letting go to the motions of the blowing wind. Towering over the ferns are brilliant conifers and palms. You lean against one of the palm trees and glide down to the ground, using it as a support. The plush grass cushions your landing, inviting you to truly relax. Though the clearing is blanketed in ferns, there is something peculiar in front of you. There's a tiny blue fern all by itself in the grass that is curled up into itself in a spiral. You lean forward to get a closer look at the miraculous little plant. And as you do, you take a deep breath in. As you breathe in, the fern slowly unfurls. And as you breathe out, letting out that long exhale, the bright blue fern curls back into itself. You breathe in, watching as the fern unfurls bit by bit shaking its leaves free. And then you exhale, watching as the fern curls back into itself in a new, relaxed state. You breathe in deeply, feeling the cool, refreshing air fill your lungs as the fern unfurls and goes free. Then you exhale as the fern does, slowly relaxing back into a natural resting position. For quite some time, you sit and watch the unique, stunning blue fern move with the rhythm of your breath. You become aware that at any point, you can return to the image of the little fern moving alongside you, encouraging you to slow down and breathe with it. You lean back and relax against the tree. Even with your eyes closed, you can see the hypnotic movements of that fern in your mind, furling and unfurling, finding comfort and expanding beyond itself. With your eyes closed, you breathe in the fresh air around you. You can taste the sweet and fresh plants that you can't name and the damp, rain-soaked soil around you. The scenery around you is a landscape of abundance with plants that have been nourished, like you have, by journeying to this place. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Let us begin our sleepy, soothing, educational journey to the wild and wonderful world 
of the late Cretaceous period. Although your eyes are closed, you already have some idea of where you are. You can feel a soft, gentle drizzle washing over your face and your hands. You can feel each droplet of water as it lands on your skin and rolls off, landing softly in the grass below your feet. Despite the rain, the air is warm and it is buzzing with humidity. You can hear trees and leaves rustling all around you in the breeze as the rain dances over them as well. But the most beautiful sound of all is the sound of water tumbling over rocks and around river bends. The river before you is certainly not a mighty one. But as you open your eyes, you can see how beautiful it is. You are deep within the rainforest, but not the rainforests of the Amazon or Australia, no. These are the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. Perhaps you are somewhere in Oregon or Washington or Vancouver, although Things as trivial as borders don't seem to matter when you're in a place as magical and connected to nature as this is. There is beauty in the lushness of the rainforests that are found here, but there is also something about them that feels wild and prehistoric. Ferns blanket the mossy earth where old rocks and fossils are buried, waiting to be uncovered. Hundreds of different species of vines and climbing plants wind their way up ancient trees, striving to reach what little sunlight is streaming from the top, dozens of feet away. The forest is so thick that it's hard to see far ahead, and yet you feel safe and protected. Though you cannot see the whole forest, nor all of its hidden inhabitants, this notion does not bother you. You know there is beauty to be found in the unknown there that there are mysteries to be discovered and ancient past to be uncovered. You take a step into the dense forest, savoring the feeling of soft, rain-brushed leaves caressing your skin as you weave around tall trees and plants to try and get deeper into this rainforest. You continue treading, putting your hand in front of you to sweep the branches and leaves out of the way. There's a rhythm to it as you step, extend your hand, and sweep. A steady rhythm that makes it feel like you are wading through a sea of plants gliding through them with ease. With each brush of your hand, the brilliant fragrance of the plants rises up and engulfs you. The ferns and other plants have a breathtaking mix of scents that wash over you in a wave, a refreshing mint aroma a soothing cinnamon, an earthy and invigorating pine and cedar. With each wave, 
you seem to uncover a new layer of the scent and find yourself becoming more and more relaxed. But soon, your waiting is interrupted by something remarkable. For quite some time, you have seen nothing but the beautiful expanse of trees and plants before you. But now, you sweep plants aside and find yourself approaching a clearing in the center of this dense and wonderful forest. You step into the center of the clearing. Once again, the rain begins to fall over you, landing in delicate droplets on your hands, your face, your chest. They mix with the aroma of the plant oils on your skin, filling the air with an invigorating mix of scents and the unique smell of the rain itself. In the center of the clearing, there is a small wooden building, not something you would expect to see this far in the woods, but even more peculiar. There are train tracks running just in front of the building. It takes you a moment to realize that you are looking at a rustic train station. The building itself has three worn sides atop a small raised platform. The roof of the train station is blanketed with a thick layer of moss that glistens with the heavy droplets of rain in a breathtaking way. It makes the whole train station appear as if it is glowing and it makes your heart skip a beat simply by looking at it. You approach the train station. It feels like you are floating in a dream, each footstep on the wet soil gentle and slow. You gaze around the clearing for a moment, wondering who else could possibly use this train station. Who was it built for? And what kind of trains would come to a place this remote, this far from society? What use did it have? You climb the old wooden steps of the train station. They creak with every step you take. Old soil and fallen leaves tumble off the planks as you climb up, leaving a cloud of dust and plants in your wake. The platform is simple, yet pleasantly colorful. There is a bench painted a vibrant mustard in the center of the platform shielded beneath a strong section of the roof. Holes in the roof let bursts of rain tumble through the ceiling and soak the wood boards below, giving the whole space an even more ethereal feeling. And as if the trained platform in the middle of the rainforest wasn't strange enough. The posters on the wall of the station are. There are posters of dinosaurs adorning the faded wooden walls of the platform. They are not childish renderings, nor modern ones. They look like they have been plucked from Victorian-era books, scrawled on faded brown scrolls with precious ink and quill. There is information scrawled in cursive around the dinosaurs. 
describing where they are from and what their habits are. For a moment, you look over them, taking in every few words, because really, your mind is caught on why this place exists. Just as you finish reading the last line on one of the posters, there is a distinct rumbling in the distance of the forest. You stand still, listening intently as the rumble grows and grows. At first, you wonder if it is thunder in this otherwise gentle rainstorm. But when you turn, you notice smoke is rising from somewhere in the forest. And not just smoke from a fire, moving smoke, a plume of it that appears to be rising from a vehicle. A train emerges through the thick forest like magic, and my, is it a thing of beauty. It is an old steam train with a large iron grate on the front and intricate moldings and designs adorning its metalwork. That smoke rises from the front of the train as it chugs along the tracks its bright red sides glistening in what little sun has managed to make its way through the thick clouds overhead. You turn and gaze at the train, shocked that it had emerged from seemingly nowhere to grace you with its presence out here. The train rumbles to a stop just before you, at the end of the platform. It brings a gust of warm wind with it that rustles your warm coat and hair. You stand there for a moment, gazing up at the glowing, warm lights of the train windows. The train makes you feel safe and welcomed even in the uncertainty surrounding its existence. You reach forward to knock on the door, eager to get some answers to the questions that you have. But just as your hand is about to reach the door, it opens. A kind-eyed man looks down at you with a smile. He is not dressed like a train conductor, nor a train worker. He is dressed like an archaeologist or field worker of some kind. He pulls his hands out of the pockets of his khaki shorts and rolls up the long sleeves of his breathable hiking shirt. On his head, he wears a wide-brimmed hat that he surely uses to protect himself from the sun. He looks a lot like a character out of an archaeology movie, or perhaps a dinosaur movie. Ah, we were hoping you would be here. May I see your ticket, please? He asks his voice as warm and comforting as honey on a drizzly day. You smile up at the man with a bit of uncertainty and tell him that you don't have a train ticket, whatever train it may be. He smiles and chuckles to himself before he motions to your coat pocket and chimes. I believe if you check your pockets, you will find exactly what you need there. You reach into your pocket, and sure enough, you feel the smooth paper of a ticket 
in the palm of your hand. You pull the ticket out, unsure of how it got there, but mesmerized by the fact that it did. You turn it over in your hands to see, written plain as day and in soft black ink, the Cretaceous Express. Before you have a chance to ask any questions, the man in the hat takes the ticket from you with a gleeful smile. Wonderful, he exclaims. With a trained hand, he quickly snips the corner of your ticket with a hole puncher. Then, with an ostentatious air, he steps aside and motions for you to step onto the train. Welcome aboard. I have a feeling you are going to love it here. You walk past him, buzzing with anticipation for whatever ride you are about to embark on. On your way past, you notice his gilded name tag, which reads, Ron, with a smiley face at the end. You turn into the main compartment of the train, and immediately you find yourself breathless in the best way possible. The train is absolutely stunning. The walls are made of thick, beautifully rich mahogany. The seats are upholstered in rich, deep red velvet that pops against the dark wood. The exterior walls consist of floor-to-ceiling glass windows. There are tables between the chairs that are intricately carved with designs you can't quite make out as you walk down the compartment to the seat listed on your ticket, 4E. You sit down in the comfortable seat and lean back, embracing the way your body sinks into the plush chair. Around you, there are a few other people. They all give you a polite head nod of acknowledgement and a smile, welcoming you aboard this strange little train. Now closer to the table, you are able to make out the designs on it. They appear to be dinosaurs of all kinds. Dinosaurs that are mixed in with tropical plants and ferns. You run your fingers over the carvings, appreciating the artistry and the obvious fondness for these creatures that is so noticeable in this wood. Just as your fingers leave the wood, the train begins to move. Everyone looks out of their windows in anticipation, leaning up against the glass with smiles on their faces. To your surprise, Ron steps out into the aisle, adjusting his hat and drawing everyone's attention to himself. He gestures to both sides in greeting of everyone and cheerfully announces, Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cretaceous Express. I will be your guide as we take this long, wonderful journey into the past, to the late Cretaceous period. Rounds of applause echo from all sides of the train, but you hesitate, unsure if Ron is being serious or not. Your question is answered only seconds later. 
when a shadow washes over the train car and a flash of light follows only moments later. When the light fades, you turn and look out at a landscape that is similar but somehow vastly different from our own. The plants look like primitive versions of modern ones. Ferns are king, stretching as far as the eye can see in this seemingly temperate climate. There are flowering plants peppering the light green and emerald grass. Flowers of red, orange, pink and yellow. There isn't a house or building or man-made structure anywhere in sight because they don't exist yet. Around you, there are a few trees that rise so tall they seem to brush the baby blue sky high overhead. The trees look similar to the ones you'd see in a forest today. Early versions of oak trees, magnolia trees, boxwood trees. There are a few tiny differences between them, but it is almost impossible to deny that they are related to one another. The land is vast, wild, and beautiful. Each flowering tree or plant you pass seems to be more beautiful than the last. Ron steps up and begins to tell you about the plants you are seeing and the magical world you are witnessing. The Cretaceous period was the longest period of the Mesozoic era. It started 145 million years ago and lasted until about 66 million years ago. Throughout the course of the Cretaceous period, there were dozens of fascinating, life-altering changes that took place on Earth. The continents began to drift away from each other. India detached from Africa and drifted in the direction of Asia. The Americas were gradually moving westward, causing the Atlantic Ocean to expand. In the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and Antarctica seem to have remained connected and began to drift away from Africa and South America. Europe was an island chain. The Cretaceous period was also a period of temperature fluctuations. While the climate was warmer than present, throughout the period a cooling trend is evident. The tropics became restricted to equatorial regions and northern latitudes experienced markedly more seasonal climatic conditions. This was also the time where flowering plants first appeared and began to spread across the landscape. Trees sprouted from the earth in much greater diversity, and by the end of this period, grass appeared. Turf on the soil strengthened it and made it more fertile, allowing for seeds and a larger biodiversity of not just plants, but mammals. Just as Ron finishes explaining this to you, he smiles and motions out the window, like this Repanomamus to the right here. You follow his gaze out the window and are shocked to see a strange creature bumbling through the foliage there. It is a fluffy, large mammal, 
strikingly similar to a Tasmanian devil. Ron explains that this is Repinomamus, the largest known mammal of the Cretaceous period. We don't know a lot about them from fossils, but what we do know is that they were predators who were short and fairly clumsy. They weren't able to move quickly, so some scientists believe that they were mainly scavengers. They are also the only known mammal to have eaten dinosaurs. You watch the Repinomamus waddle its way through the underbrush, not even bothering to give your train the slightest glance. It appears to be sniffing the air, surely tracking something or looking for its next meal. It amazes you to see something that existed so long ago, walking through the world like any other creature would. But suddenly, the Repinomamus takes off into the brush, rushing with a bit more urgency. Ron smiles one more time as he looks out the window. And speaking of dinosaurs, it appears that we have our first one here, he chimes. The whole train car turns to look out the window, and what they see is one of the most recognizable dinosaurs to ever walk the earth. You know what it is before Ron says it, and the fact that you are seeing one floods your body with warmth. It's a Triceratops. It is a lone one, standing in a meadow to the side of the train. The wheels creak as the train comes to a steady rest on the tracks. You put your hands up on the glass of the window, mesmerized by the creature that is standing before you. It is nearly 30 feet long, much bigger than you ever could have imagined before seeing one in person. And despite its size and the three horns on its head, you feel safe near it. It has a visibly docile nature as it leans down to munch on cycads and ferns surrounding it. It moves and chews at a slow, steady pace, one that instills serenity and peace in the ever-present rhythm of life. Ron explains that the name Triceratops means three-horned face, but Triceratops didn't actually have three horns. They had two horns on the top of their head and a shard of keratin on the end of their nose which many people wrongly believe is a horn. The keratin shard would not have been useful in fighting, and some scientists believe their normal horns wouldn't be either. It is unknown what exactly Triceratops used their horns for, but someday scientists hope to figure it out. Triceratops are a frequently found fossil in the western United States and Canada, so new information is uncovered about them fairly often. You continue on from the Triceratops, watching over your shoulder as the train carries on. The Triceratops reaches over and grabs a palm frond eating it easily with its dozens of teeth. But it isn't long before you encounter another dinosaur. As the train chugs along the tracks, entering a thin forest full of trees that are similar to oak trees, Ron laughs and points up. You look up through the glass roof of the train, and the creature hovering over you takes your breath away. At first, you assume it's a Brachiosaurus, 
It completely towers over the train with a long, slender neck and a body similar to an elephant's. It nonchalantly grabs hold of leaves, taking off entire branches with ease. But Ron tells you all, it isn't a Brachiosaurus, because they were found in the Jurassic period. This is an Alamosaurus, a similar herbivore, which happens to be the largest dinosaur known to have lived in North America. It is a gentle giant that peacefully ate leaves, though little more is known about it aside from its diet. You watch in awe for quite some time as the Alamosaurus dines on leaves, eating an entire tree's worth in only a matter of minutes. It is a graceful creature, one that you cannot believe you have the privilege of watching. Slowly, the train continues on. Ron tells you that there will be more creatures on the horizon, but that for some time, you will just be driving through the forest. You turn on your side and cozy up as you gaze out the window. The trees passing by and the wild forests of the Cretaceous period look like something out of a painting. You feel at peace, comforted by Ron's knowledge and the beauty of the landscape. Ever so slowly, the rumble of the train and the steady rhythm of its motion lulls you closer and closer to sleep. You know that if anything comes, Ron will awaken you. But for now, you will drift off to sleep. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey to a cozy, magical library on a rainy day. Together, we will step into wondrous books and be transformed as we learn and grow together, exploring peaceful, serene places and words you don't often hear used. I want you to imagine yourself opening your eyes and seeing this brilliant library for the first time. It is a true work of art. The tall, tall ceilings stretch two stories high, and the top is covered in a mix of beautiful watercolor frescoes with intricate crown molding and glass skylights that give you just a peek of the outside world. And my, is it a perfect day to be at the library. Overhead, the sky is an ethereal mosaic of grays, blacks, and soft whites. Thick clouds blanket the heavens, and cascading down from them are dozens, hundreds of raindrops, all gently dancing against the skylight above you. The sound of that rain 
pitter-pattering against the roof and the glass is a background, ambient noise to the rest of your journey through the library, one that brings you comfort. All around are thick mahogany bookcases that stretch all the way up to the ceiling. There are rolling ladders with them, the kind you've only seen in fairy tales and libraries that have existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. A few people stand upon them, reaching over to find the right book as they stand over these works of art and stories hidden inside of them. You find yourself sitting on one of those old brown leather couches. It is a timeless piece, one that makes you think of rainy days and stories told long, long ago. The library is largely empty now. A few people sit in chairs on the outskirts of the room against stained glass windows, flipping through books and sipping the coffee or tea they've brought along with them. You meander over to a cozy tea and coffee station that the library has set up in the corner. You pour a steaming cup of hot water into an orange mug, then grab a chamomile and lavender tea bag and plop it into the cup. The fragrant steam rises and relaxes you almost immediately. And as you squeeze a lemon into the cup, the contrast of the cool lemon juice on your fingers against the steam is a welcome one that puts you even more at ease. You take a sip of the tea as you make your way around the beautiful library, meandering slowly as you take in each and every bookshelf that you pass. You think for a moment of all of the words bound within these leather backings, all the words that you may not know and all of the ways they can be used. You find yourself drawn to one light orange book tucked between two large green ones. The outside of the binding reads Aurora in tiny gold script. And as you open the book, you find the pages blank. You scroll through them, perplexed wondering how exactly this book came to be and what purpose it serves. But then, in the very center of the book, there is one thing written rather plainly. Aurora, originally the name of the Roman goddess of sunrise. The word is used to describe dawn in the early morning, and also is a name ascribed to the cosmic, luminous phenomenon that happens in the upper hemisphere. You had never truly thought about what a beautiful word it was. You stare at it for quite some time soaking it in, and then something strange begins to happen. 
The words on the page get a golden glow around them. You squint and lean in to look at them. Then, curiosity gets the best of you. You extend your finger and press it to those beautiful glowing words, and suddenly, the scene around you changes. You feel as though you've been sucked into a vacuum within the book. For a moment, the world around you is an otherworldly mix of sparkling colors, as if you are traveling through time and space itself. And then, you land upon the ground, the first thing you notice isn't the scene before you. It is the cold crispness of the fresh air hitting your lungs. In that air, you can smell cypress trees, pine trees, fresh moss growing along the river, and canyon walls far far below you, and when you really look, you are stunned. You are standing safely and peacefully on a cliff, overlooking a vibrant canyon before you. It is still early morning. The sun has yet to peek up over these orange canyon walls, but you know immediately where you are. You're in Zion National Park, standing at the end of the canyon overlook trail. Below you is one of the most stunning canyons on earth. The Virgin River winds along the sandy, iron-infused banks, which give the entire vista its characteristic, otherworldly rust color. But that rust color is going to change before your very eyes. On the distant horizon, the sun has begun to creep up over the canyon. It is dawn. You realize at once that this, this is Aurora over Zion. At first, the sky is slivers of orange, blue, and yellow, as if the sun itself hasn't awakened to its own vibrancy. It paints the sky in feathery, sleepy strokes, giving the clouds some faint definition and glow. And as it does so, it blankets the entire landscape in peace. This time of day, this aurora is a time before most of the world awakens. It is a time where one can truly just be with the landscape around them, where one can stand in contemplative silence, listening to the birds sing their songs and whisper their secrets into the universe. And so, that is exactly what you do. You sit down on the rocky ground next to an aromatic juniper tree, and you listen to those bird calls echoing off the canyon walls. Then, you watch as the sun puts on the most magical show on earth. 
It paints the skies in a mosaic of colors. Clementine, salmon, sanguine, goldenrod, even lilac and lavender. As if the sun cannot make up its mind, so it washes everything in every color imaginable. But perhaps the most beautiful thing of all is the way this light splashes across the canyon in slow motion, changing the colors of the walls as it moves. It illuminates the tips of the mountains first, giving their brilliant orange color a spotlight for the world. Then it creeps down, 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 down over the canyon walls, illuminating them slowly in blue, then gold then bright crimson red. You can't help but view it much like a painting, like the heavens have to do this task every morning to make the landscape beautiful for the long and magnificent day ahead. Just as the sun touches the river below, you feel yourself sink back. Once more, you are in that otherworldly space between worlds, in a sea of colors and lights, feeling utterly at peace. And then you blink, and once more, you are met with cold, fresh air. Only this time, it is much, much colder. Above you is the inky black sky now. There seem to be thousands of stars twinkling just above your head. So close that you feel as if you can reach out and grab them. Reach out and feel them pulsing in the palm of your hand. You are so mesmerized by the sky above you that for an instant you don't even notice the sound of the crackling fire just beside you. You glance to your right to see a carefully made bonfire crackling sending embers into the dark night air. You are surrounded by fresh snow that sparkles and reflects the warm light of the fire. It is so fluffy and perfectly smooth that it doesn't seem like it can even be real. You're lying in the snow wrapped in a thick, warm parka, with a cup of hot cocoa at your side. You take a sip of the warm cocoa, letting the rich flavor wash over your tongue and soothe your soul, contrasting the scent and feeling of the brisk pine-tinged air you are breathing in. Your mind drifts back to the word you touched, drifts back to Aurora. You find yourself whispering the word simply to see how it feels against your lips. Aurora, Aurora, Aurora. Then, the sky above you transforms. Aurora Borealis washes across the inky black night, turning
turning the sky into one of the world's most beautiful art displays. It is a wave of blue, green, and dark, brilliant purple that pulsates and shifts across the sky in a misty, beautiful wave. It is otherworldly, so breathtaking and mesmerizing that you hold your breath as you gaze up at it. For quite some time, you lie there in peace, watching those colors dance and sway. The tall pine trees are silhouetted by the lights, adding a depth that only makes the scene more beautiful than it already is. You feel something gentle land in your hand, you turn your head to see yet another book in your grasp. And this one isn't as plain as the last. It is coated in etchings of flowers and pine trees. A distant land that you feel completely drawn to. You run your fingers over the cover. It reads, supine. You feel the word dance over your tongue. Supine, 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 supine. You lift the cover of the book and scroll through blank page after blank page looking for the definition, looking for the story this book is trying to tell you. There, in the center of the book, this time in colorful ink, is the word, supine, of a person lying face upwards. The adjective from Latin supinus, bent backwards. The realization washes over you moments after the word rolls off your tongue. Right now, you are lying supine, gazing up at the scene before you. And as that realization comes, the scene once more begins to change. This time, you close your eyes. You feel the gentle tug of your body as you are brought into that vacuum of space, that in-between worlds, and then you are lying supine yet again. But you don't open your eyes immediately this time, you keep them closed for just a bit, just to see if you can guess where you are. You can hear the rustle of plants all around you. You can feel soft earth brushing against your skin, kissing you as the breeze winds across wherever you are. In the distance, you can hear birds chirping loudly, the way they only chirp on a warm, beautifully sunny day. And, indeed, you have no doubt that it is sunny. You can feel the sun on your skin causing your muscles to relax more and more with every passing second. You feel as though you are beginning to melt into the soft ground beneath you. The breeze dancing over your skin keeps you just cool enough underneath the brilliant sun. And then, 
there's another sound that you hear. This one is much, much more distant, coming from the far horizon, you would suppose. This sound is the sound of boats sailing through calm waters. On occasion, you can hear their low horns blowing, like they're saying hello to every boat they pass by. Slowly, you begin to open your eyes. The first thing you see is the baby blue sky. It is peppered with ethereal clouds, clouds that look as though they belong in paintings. They are fluffy balls of cotton that seem to meander across the sky at their own leisurely pace, with no destination in mind and certainly no schedule. You tilt your head slightly, and it is only then that you realize you are lying on a hillside, but not just any hillside. This is a hillside absolutely blanketed in wildflowers of all shapes, sizes, and colors. You see daisies bobbing and swaying in the breeze, lilac-colored lupines lobbing up and down as busy bees land on them, collecting pollen, orange poppies that pop against the blue sky above, showing you how truly colorful the world can be. In front of you is something almost as beautiful as the flowers around you. At the base of the hill is a harbor town laced with cobblestone streets. The docks and boardwalks extend out into the sparkling ocean, which stretches as far as the eye can see. Old, antique boats pepper the harbor, moving almost as leisurely as the clouds roll overhead. You think about life in that peaceful town, what it must be like to be a resident waking up on a lazy morning on the hillside coated in wildflowers how it must feel to breathe in the soothing aroma of nature's finest bouquet day in and day out. And then you think for a moment about where you are, about how nice it is to lie supine on your back with no goal in mind but to simply be and to let your body relax and unwind. You close your eyes yet again and listen. You can hear the buzz of the busy bees flitting in the flowers around you. You can feel the caress of the wildflowers brushing against your skin and the grasses dancing over your forearms and calves and the crown of your head. It is so serene, so calm. You feel yourself growing sleepy. And then two sensations surprise you. First, you feel something land upon your nose. When you open your eyes, you are greeted with the sight of a butterfly resting upon your nose, gently 
flapping its wings. It takes off from its perch and floats above you. You can see the sun through its thin, airy wings, which are so gentle, so precious, that it's hard to believe they can even keep the butterfly aloft. The second sensation is the book landing in your hands yet again. You glance over to see the title staring back at you. This time, the cover is stark white, the color of snow, and the title is in the thinnest, softest cursive you have ever seen. It reads Gossamer. You roll the word over your lips a few times. Gossamer, gossamer. Once more, you flip through those empty pages until you come to the only writing. To your surprise this time, you are also met with an illustration. It is an illustration of the butterfly that has just landed on your nose, so lifelike that it almost looks like the butterfly itself has been pressed into the pages. And above it, the words are scarped in that same gentle print, gossamer, used to refer to something very light, thin, or delicate. By now, you know what is coming next. You close your eyes as you enter that space between spaces yet again. It is a welcome feeling, one that makes your body buzz with excitement and yet, at the same time, feel utterly at peace. Before you even open your eyes, you feel it. A cool mist washes over you, instantly refreshing your body and your mind. You can hear the unmistakable roar of a waterfall just before you, and in it, you can feel the power and beauty that it contains. When you open your eyes, you are met with a sight unlike any other. The waterfall seems impossibly tall above you. It cascades down the slick granite cliffs, landing in a pool of rocks and moss below, before it continues to wind its way down even deeper into the valley that you are now standing in. You gaze for a moment at the carpet of moss and lichen and water-loving plants that cling to the rock walls around the falls. They embrace the constant mist, they thrive in it and their vibrant colors are so rich that they cause a sense of serenity to fill your entire body. You turn your gaze back up to the falls as they tumble down. It is incredible that the falls cascade down with such force, and yet, they appear to be moving in slow motion. Even more surprising is the gossamer veil surrounding them, the mist that seems to move independently of them, so thin and delicate that it's hard to believe it even exists. And it is in that gossamer mist 
that you see an array of colors. It is a rainbow, light refracting from the sun that has just peeked out from behind the thick storm clouds overhead. It is breathtaking to see a rainbow suspended in space like this, sparkling alongside the waterfall as it continues its journey down into the canyon. You watch this for quite some time, relishing the feeling of cool mist on your skin. But then there's another feeling, only this time it is at the top of your head. You gaze up to see raindrops cascading down from the dark clouds overhead. Within seconds of them beginning to fall, the landscape around you seemingly changes. The pine trees seem to be an even brighter green now, popping against the sky. As raindrops collect on their fragrant needles, you watch them magnify the world around them before slowly dropping from the trees and landing in the loam below. You scurry away from the waterfall and settle underneath a tall oak tree to watch the rain fall. You breathe a little deeper now, taking in the newly awakened aroma of the forest. You can smell that brightly scented moss, the briskness of the air, the tart, piney aroma of the trees and herbs around. And then there's that other smell, the smell of the earth, of the stone washed with the fresh rainwater, that petrichor. The book lands in your hands, the title staring up at you in a silky, silver print. You scroll through the book, page after page after page, until you finally come to the words, Petrichor, the pleasant, earthy smell after rain, from the Greek words for stone and the ethereal blood of the gods. It is the petrichor that awakens your senses and calms your mind now. The petrichor that makes you feel more connected to the earth around you than anything else ever has. You cling to that scent and the feeling it gives you. And then, ever so slowly, you close your eyes. And when you open them, you are staring at that bookshelf in the library once more. There is a new book sitting on the shelf before you a collection of beautiful words. You pick the book up and meander to a plush chair in the very back of the library. You take a long, calm sip of the lavender chamomile tea in your hand, relishing the sweetness of the flowers and herbs and finding a sense of clarity in the tartness of the lemon. When you sit by the window, you notice that it has begun to rain a little harder outside. You coil yourself up in the plush white blanket you found on the chair, savoring the warmth and comfort that it provides. 
Once you are nice and cozy, you reach over and pop open the window beside you. It is a rainy summer day. The brisk chill of the air is just enough to make the blanket and tea useful. You open the window even more, and the trees outside begin to look as though they are part of a painting. Then you breathe in deeply, allowing that fresh air to fill your lungs. The dewy petrichor makes you sink a little deeper into the chair. Somehow, it feels like the petrichor is telling stories to you. Stories of rainy days in distant lands. Stories of rainy days beyond castle walls. Stories of ancestors riding their horses through wildflower-coated woods. Stories of people in harborside towns, hiding underneath bakery overhangs, breathing in the petrichor and the aroma of freshly baked bread. You give a dreamy sigh and pop open the book before you. It is all in long, flowery cursive, and as your eyes drift down over the words, you feel the sense of serenity within you grow and grow and grow. The book reminds you that there is beauty and power in words, that they have the ability to transport us to soothe us, to tell us stories of connection and stories that ground us. There are always new words to learn and always new places those words can transport us to. By simply being in touch with the world around us, we allow our bodies to rest. So whether it be awakening to see the aurora or traveling far north to see it or lying supine in a meadow filled with gossamer winged butterflies or standing beneath the gossamer mist of a roaring waterfall while finding peace in the dewy petrichor the falling rain creates. There is rest waiting kindly for you whenever you are ready. I hope you have enjoyed this story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. And until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a sleepy train journey through time. We'll explore the Renaissance in Europe, the late Edo period in Japan, the Wild West in America, and even modern day around the world. We'll rest in our cozy train car as the changing world moves around us, giving us glimpses of beautiful landscapes, famous people, and important moments and movements in history. You open your eyes on the boat to discover that you are, indeed, exactly where you thought you would be. You are in a city in Italy. 
the buildings are awash in bright colors, and the people are dressed in what appears to be Renaissance clothes. You rub your eyes to get a good look at them, rather confused on how you've ended up here. It feels like you're in the midst of a play, like you've stumbled into a dream of some kind, but you don't feel unsafe. On the contrary, you feel like somehow you're exactly where you're meant to be. Excuse me, a woman's voice chimes just behind you. You turn slowly in the boat to meet her eye. She has a kind, warm face with honey-colored eyes and a bright smile on her face. She's dressed in an outfit you've never seen before. She looks official, almost like a train conductor in a uniform. But the dress she's wearing is flowy, like it was plucked out of some strange time period in the past, or the future that has never or has yet to occur. Excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, she says, but I believe you have the pleasure of joining us on this train. Would you mind handing me the ticket out of your pocket? You reach into your silk pajama pocket. Sure enough, just inside is a thick piece of paper. A ticket with green and blue writing on it, all in cursive. All aboard the history tour is all it reads, but that gives you a sense of calm. You hand it to the woman who stamps the ticket with her ticket puncher and hands it back to you with a smile. Welcome aboard, she chimes. A relaxing, peaceful journey through history awaits you. You step onto the train with no hesitation, and when you enter it, you're blown away by how luxurious yet cozy it is. The interior is finely crafted with mahogany. The large, plush green seats are not just seats but large enough to be beds. Pillows that you could sink your whole body into sit beneath each window, offering travelers a place to rest their weary heads. You sit down on the seat with a relaxed sigh. The train car smells of so many soothing scents, chamomile, lavender, and steaming Earl Grey tea with just a dash of milk. You rest your head against the floor-to-ceiling window, breathing in the comforting aroma as you grow more and more comfortable in your seat. The train woman steps on and closes the door behind her. She gives you a nod, telling you that any moment now, you will be heading out. And you do. The train rumbles to life. Slowly, it begins to depart from the station, 
emitting big plumes of dark smoke in the sky that leave a magical, almost fairy tale like trail behind you. You listen to the rhythm of the train, the rumble as it moves on along the tracks. You can practically picture the wheels moving around and around in perfect motion. The sound of that steady rhythm makes you a tad bit sleepy. It is something you can rely on. Something you can always turn your attention to if you get too distracted by the scenery of history out of your window. But my, what beautiful scenery it is. You gaze out to see the stunning countryside of Italy, and as you do, you feel warmth in your hand. You look down at your ticket to see that it is glowing in a warm orange light. As it glows, words are slowly rearranged and change on the ticket face. Now, it reads Renaissance period. You are in Renaissance Italy. The Renaissance, or rather, a long renaissance in Italy was a period of time between the 1300s and the 1500s. After years of darkness and struggle, the people of the renaissance period were able to experience life in earnest and not just survive, but thrive. The word renaissance itself means rebirth in French. And this period of time was indeed a rebirth for the people of Europe. It was a period of time where people decided to actually look back in order to move forward. There was a renewed interest in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, not just in their society, but in their way of thinking, in their art, in their creations. For so long the world had been focused on praising the gods, focused on good and evil and war. But during the Renaissance, people used time to reflect, time to think about the world around them. There was an increased interest in exploring our purpose on this earth, an increased interest in philosophy, in humanism, a belief in self self-worth, and individual expression. And as you gaze out the window, you can clearly see that expressed in the Italian countryside here. The train winds past farm after farm, full of beautiful crops. There are olive trees, citrus groves, and lush gardens flourishing with vegetables. But the people aren't just working the fields, covered in grime and tired. There are people sitting under trees, relaxing in the light of the warm sun. There are even some people reading from books. It was during the Renaissance, in 1450, when Johannes Gutenberg 
invented the printing press. For the first time in history, copies could be made of written works, which meant ideas could spread across the whole of Europe. And at the time, there were a lot of ideas to go around. These new books that people had access to gave them a more expansive view of their continent, of the world, and of their purpose. You watch as the train slowly meanders around a family farm. The father sits under a large, towering tree. You aren't sure what kind, but the wood is a warm, cinnamon color, and the leaves rise over their heads and provide shade like a massive canopy. The father turns a page in a book with a look of pride on his face as he reads the words aloud to his family. His wife has her head resting on his chest, and the children around him are staring at their father with wide, excited eyes, almost as if they can't believe the beautiful words they are hearing. It is a beautiful summer day, and all is right in the world on their cozy little farm on the outskirts of the city. You wind through more and more countryside, but in the distance, you spot a city growing on the horizon. And even from here, you have a sense of what city it is. It is the city that perhaps was influenced the most by the Renaissance, Florence, Italy. And what a sight the city is. The orange and red terracotta roofs are like a shining sun in a sea of mountains and forests. You can see the dome of the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Flower, or simply the Florence Cathedral, the most impressive building in the entire city. There is a reason that this city looks so much more luxurious, so much more aesthetically pleasing than the previous city that you saw. And that is because of the city's rulers. The Medici family were the rulers of Florence for much of the Renaissance. A family of incredible wealth, they spent their fortune on artists and creators. They hired painters and sculptors to create breathtaking art for both their family and the city itself. As you round the corner, you are able to see one of these artists at work. You chug along a beautiful city street. Flowers hang in the flower boxes all around you. People meander through the sunny streets without a care in the world. And then, as you come across a town square, you see it. A man standing before a statue. It's a statue you, and pretty much anyone in the world, would recognize immediately. It's the statue of David, created by Michelangelo. Here, in person, not hidden behind any museum ropes. It is even more breathtaking than you ever imagined. The body of the statue glistens in the sun, and only then do you realize that it has just been chiseled, and 
is just being finished. The man standing below the statue is none other than Michelangelo himself. You watch in awe for quite a long moment, marveling at this special moment in history. And then the train continues on. As the train sails out of Florence, you are met once again with the countryside, and, to your surprise, the woman who helped you on the train comes over to your plush seat. She pulls out a tray and sets down multiple plates of food. At first, you are surprised. You've never seen food like this before. She explains that this is a meal that the wealthy would be able to have in Italy during the Renaissance period. And it truly looks delicious. On the plates before you are a roast pheasant and a large, fresh salad. The salad is topped with fennels and artichokes. And off to the side, there is a big, ripe peach, one of the sweetest ones you've ever tasted in your life. You dine on this amazing meal as the train continues to chug along. And there, in the distance, you spot something that you wouldn't expect to see in the countryside in Europe during this time period. You see a large tunnel carved into the mountainside. As you near it, a wave of color washes over you. You look around with a bit of confusion, unsure of what's to come next. But then, slowly, ever so slowly, you emerge into the light and you are no longer in Italy, no longer in the Renaissance period. In fact, you are years and years later, and worlds and worlds away. The countryside beyond your window is drastically different from the countryside of Italy. The air simmers with humidity, and the landscape is even more lush and green and breathtaking. There are mountains beyond your window that rise high into the sky, so high, in fact, that their peaks are blanketed by a layer of thick mist, a haze that makes it even more mysterious. But when you spot something in the distance, the mystery of where you are exactly melts away. Because before you, on the horizon, is a tall white castle. But it is not a European-style castle. It is a Japanese castle with painstakingly designed sloped roofs and beautiful features. Its sides are painted a sleek, stunning white. Once more, you feel a warmth begin to radiate in your hand. You look down to see that glowing amber light, and within it, the words on your ticket begin to change once more, staring back at you, written in a blue and green font, is the Edo period. You are in Edo period Japan, in this case, the late Edo period. The Edo period was an era from 1603 to 1867 an era full of history, progress, and art. The period began with the governance of the Tokugawa Shogunate, 
and ended with the Meiji Restoration, which was marked by the restoration of imperial rule by the final shogun, Takugawa Yoshinobu. During this time period, Japan was united for the first time under a single government. The true rulers were shoguns, not the emperors, who were mostly just figureheads. There was a strict social hierarchy in Japan at the time, though. It was a time where people of different social standings all seemed to flourish. At the time, Japan was almost entirely isolated from the rest of the world, except for some Chinese and Dutch traders that were only allowed to stay in a special quarter in Nagasaki. Much like the Renaissance, this was a period of time for reflection, for growth, and for art. People began to find even more of an interest in philosophy, specifically in Neo-Confucianism. The economy was incredibly stable during this time period, allowing for people to find joy in simple pleasures. It was during the Edo period that Kabuki, a classical form of Japanese dance drama, developed, and many different kinds of art were able to come to the forefront and be enjoyed by the general public. It was the first time in history that people in urban areas had the time and the means to enjoy art and the urban lifestyle and culture, especially the pleasure-seeking aspects of it. This pursuit of pleasure and enjoyment became known as ukiyo-ye, which means the floating, fleeting world. Geisha became popular, poetry flourished, and, perhaps most notable of all, woodblock art prints became something that people of almost all social standings could afford to buy. As your train rounds a corner, you find yourself in a traditional Japanese town. The buildings are crafted of wood and paper. The people are at peace, meandering down the streets, tending to their quaint gardens, enjoying the feeling of the sun and the warm breeze. But at the end of the street, you see something rather peculiar. There is a man bent over there, a man that is carving something into wood. As the train grows closer and eventually stops next to the man, you find yourself glued to the window. The art that he is carving is something you have seen hundreds of times before. It is one of the most parodied and referenced pieces of art in the entire world. It is the great wave off Kanagawa, and the artist sitting before you, hard at work, is none other than Katsushka Hokusai. It is the most famous print in Hokusai's collection known as 36 views of Mount Fuji. The wave in the picture is so prominent that some people don't even notice Mount Fuji in the background, practically dwarfed by the white and blue wave. It is estimated that there were around 5,000 original copies of the great wave of Kanagawa created, but few of them survive to this day. 
You watch in awe as he works like the master he is on the woodblock print. And as the train continues on, you carry a feeling of magical beauty and peace unlike anything you felt before. The cities and countryside of Japan are breathtaking. The people seem happy going about their days, enjoying art, going to puppet theaters, choosing clothes that represent the fashion statement of the times, rather than just a necessity. It is a good time to be there, a good time to be breathing in the fresh mountain air and listening to the sound of the bamboo creaking as it's blown back and forth perpetually. You continue on deeper into the countryside. In the far distance, you see Mount Fuji rising over the horizon. Its snow-capped top is inimitable and, for the first time, you consider how remarkable it is that you can still gaze upon that same mountain today. Soon, the woman from the train approaches you again. She gives you a smile and puts several plates and bowls down before you. And, to your surprise, it doesn't look all that different from food that is eaten in Japan to this day. There's a bowl of steaming brown rice, fragrant with herbs and spices. There's a bowl of hot miso soup, and a plate of vegetables and freshly caught fish. You recline in your comfortable seat and gaze out the window as you dine on this wonderful meal. A meal that is so perfect it hasn't changed in hundreds of years. In the distance, you spot a tunnel. As you approach it this time, you know what you're in for. You close your eyes as you go through the tunnel. A flash of light envelops you. And when you open your eyes again, there are snow-capped mountains blanketing the horizon. But around you are no fields of green. There are no Japanese houses no kabuki theaters or woodblock art. But the strangest part is you are at the tail end of the Edo period. You're just on the other side of the world. The ticket in your hand glows with warmth, illuminating you in the cabin in that golden light. And on it, the American frontier magically appears. You gaze out your window with a new understanding of what you're seeing. These are fields of amber stretching as far as your eye can see. The trees are sparse yet beautiful reaching up for the heavens as if they're just there to connect the earth to them. The land is untouched by Europeans for the most part. There are no buildings, no towns, no settlements. There are just stunning, wide open plains. As you chug through the landscape, you lean your head back and allow yourself to grow more and more sleepy. To the right of you, they finally appear, a wagon train, 
cutting through the landscape to make the long, long journey west. They are pioneers, making their way across the stunning expanse of land with hopes of developing new towns and finding new farms on the other coast. They travel in covered wagons in groups of up to a hundred, each carrying all of their belongings on the back of a wagon. All that they need to start a new life is in the wagon, and they are unsure of what lies on the distant horizon. You watch as they ride their horses through the untamed wilderness, wind in their hair, wind that smells of sweet grass and juniper and cornflowers. In the distance, you see a tunnel in the mountain. You know what is to come, so you take a deep breath and soak up every last bit of the landscape that you can. The way the sun shines on the amber waves of grain, the way the wind makes the trees billow, the way your eyes can rest easily, staring into the wilderness without a single thing blocking your line of sight. And then, once more, you are in the tunnel. You listen to the steady rhythm of the train, the chug and the clinking of metal on metal. It's all so soothing in the darkness that you find your eyes slowly, slowly closing. The train woman lays a gentle hand on your shoulder and hands you something. You open your eyes to see a steaming cup of tea in your grasp as you emerge out of the tunnel. You wonder what's next, but then you realize where you are. You're in present times, somewhere in the countryside in the UK. There are rolling green hills around you. A modern, quaint little town is nestled between the hills. Cars and bikes meander down the hills on this gray, rainy day. But it's peaceful, so utterly peaceful, that you feel more and more sleepy by the second. That tea will warm you up. Feel free to take it back home to your nice, cozy bed. The train woman chimes. The train finally comes to a gentle stop. The woman helps you to your feet with a kind smile. She drops a sugar cube in your tea. You watch with sleepy eyes as it dissolves before you. Then you take a sip of the calming chamomile tea. What a journey you have been on, and what a great thing to give you as you continue on your way. You wave to the train woman, thanking her for this experience. And as you step off the train under the shelter of an umbrella, warmed by the steam of the tea, you think about how truly lucky you are to be here and now. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet 
dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Bond's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey far beneath the crystal waves of a distant sea to explore long-forgotten civilizations and the wondrous beauty of the worlds hidden on the ocean floor. You find yourself on a distant shore on a rocky, glorious island. The egg yolk sun, which is high overhead, kisses your skin as it shines in the cloudless sky. The touch of its rays warms you, allowing your muscles and body as a whole to be at ease on this beautiful day. The breeze is gentle, just enough to keep the warmth of the sun from being too overpowering and allowing your body to be comfortable and cozy. Before you, the ocean sparkles in the light of that same sun. is a mosaic of color, cerulean and turquoise and cyan and cornflower, all of which dance and sway against each other, transforming depending on how that golden sunlight falls upon them. The gentle waves that rise catch the sunlight, coruscating as if they've made of millions of millions of diamonds. Although, what lies beneath those waves and within them is far from precious than any gemstone could dream of being. Standing on the shore, you are not in a bathing suit. Instead, You find yourself in a futuristic diving suit, like something you have only seen in movies. It is like a thin, comfortable diving suit, covering your arms and legs, but leaving your hands free to touch and explore the water that is before you. And the beautiful things that lie beneath it. The helmet atop your head isn't bulky or heavy. It is like you are in a cozy bubble. There is plenty of room for you to breathe, and within it, you feel a sense of freedom and comfort. Feeling secure in your suit, you take a step toward the waves. It is cool to the touch of your exposed feet, invigorating you. With the sun still shining on your face, it is a brilliant contrast, a reminder of what summer days are truly for. Step by step, you go deeper into the beautiful waves. You feel them rise up over your legs until you are waist deep in the water. The sand beneath you is steady and comfortable, welcoming you to continue your journey into the sea. You continue to walk, submerging your waist, your torso, and soon, your whole body. Under the water, it is like a different world. The scene before you is like something out of a dream, a world beneath our world. The sun flickers through the top of the water, 
illuminating the shallow ocean floor that you find yourself floating just above. All around you, fish glide through the water like they are flying, weightless. They travel in schools, silvery schools that move together as a unit. For a moment, you simply watch them as they make their way through the water, sailing effortlessly wherever the gentle currents take them. They glisten in the sunlight, their thin and delicate scales, a stunning mix of blue and silver that shines with every motion they make. They glide right by your head, as if you are not even there. So close that you feel you could reach out and touch them. But instead, they continue on, sailing ahead of you. And what is ahead of you steals your breath away. There is a city unlike any city you've seen before, an ancient, forgotten city, tucked away here beneath the waves for you and only you to explore. Even after the hundreds of years that it has been here, it is still in incredible shape. The buildings have retained their height, their designs, and you can even make out the streets that lace between them. You glide forward in the water, flying through as effortlessly as the fish do. You feel weightless and free, embraced by this otherworldly place at this magical time. The fish swim alongside you, darting above and below, making long, tall arcs around you. It feels like you are playing with them, almost like you are a part of them. As you near the stunning ruins, their true grandeur comes to light. The buildings are blanketed in swaths of greenery, underwater plants that sway and dance with the movement of the ocean making these ruins somehow still feel alive. They give the entire city a magical feel, like there are secrets and wonders waiting around every corner that lies before you. Tucked beneath these vibrant underwater plants, there are etchings within the ancient stone. You swim forward, running your bare fingertips along these breathtaking works of art. They are illustrations of all the things that make life beautiful. The sun and stars and moon are etched into the stone in breathtaking detail. You feel the ridges and marks of them, of this celestial work of art that was created hundreds of years ago. And within it, you swear you can feel the marks of the artist's tool, the chisels they used to chip away at this beautiful stone all those years ago. You imagine for a moment what their life was like and how they felt as they were creating this work of art. Did they know that you would be here, 
tracing your fingers along the surface so long after they sat down and brought it to the world. Did they know how beautiful it would become as they wove their heart and soul into each stroke of their tool, alongside the moons, stars, and sun? There are bits and pieces of the earth scrawled across the stone, a reminder that the place they lived in was so different from our own, and yet so strikingly similar. There are stone flowers carved, so many that it looks as if they were crafting a meadow of their own. There are sunflowers, tulips, poppies, all depicted in beautiful detail. You can't help but wonder if all those years ago, the artist lay in those same meadows, if they looked upon the same mountains and valleys with awe and wonder and respect. The world around us has always been replete with wonder, and we have always been spectators of its grandeur. You run your fingers over the stone carvings one more time. They feel smooth beneath your touch, worn after years of sitting with the ocean in motion. For a long, long time, the ocean waves have been smoothing this surface, finishing this canvas that an artist created for his city. You back up in the waves slightly, swimming away from the intricate etchings to get a look at the building as a whole. It is tall, with tiered edges that descend downward, like a rocky cliff that a waterfall descends over. The doorway in the center is arched with more of the carvings lining the edges of it. It's a grand doorway, one that surely belongs to a building that was once important, that was once visited by dozens of people daily. There are windows peppered across the surface of the building. For a moment, you wonder what those windows used to look out on. Were they the same flower fields that the artist carved into the building? Were there forests or citrus groves stretching as far as the eye could see? Or perhaps the view out of those windows simply overlooked this city in all its glory. From them, perhaps you could look out over the city and admire all the wonderful people within it. You swim forward, once more gliding through the water with ease. You peek around the corner of the door wanting to get a closer look at the interior of the building. You wonder if there will be some clue, some indicator of what this building was once used for. But the inside is more worn than the outside. There appears to be a stone counter of some sort in the corner of the room. Along the tall stone walls, there is long forgotten pottery sunken into the sandy surface of the ocean floor. You swim closer and reach down, taking one of these old, 
antique pots by the edge of the lip. It is still thick, despite all its time down here, and it looks to have been expertly crafted. There is a curved handle attached to it, a curved handle that nearly mimics the curves of the waves that are surely moving across the surface of the water far above you. It is a beautiful piece of art, this piece of pottery. You move your fingers over the edges of it, feeling the ridges and curves that were so beautifully made by hand. It's remarkable to think that this city and everything within it was carved in a similar way, made by hands within the city, made for people within the city. You gently place the pottery back down in the sand where it belongs, perhaps weeks or months from now. Someone else will journey to this city and find it. Perhaps they will also run their hands over it and take it in, admiring how it came to be and daydreaming about who exactly it was that made it. You swim back out of the building and gaze around in awe. The sunlight filtering in through the waves has cast the city aglow in coruscating light. Ripples of gold and white flicker across the surface of the buildings marbling them. The slow, constant movement of the waves relaxes you, reminding you that there is no rush here. You can move through this city at your own pace. You can move through any journey of your choosing at your own pace. You glide through the city, relishing the feeling of the cool waves and the comforting warmth of the sun on you. The buildings around you hold thousands of stories within them, and they rise out of the sand almost like mountains on a prairie. They rise and fall like ridges, tall buildings next to smaller buildings, next to two-story buildings, next to long, single-level buildings. There aren't just a variety of sizes, but a variety of styles as well. Some of the buildings have arched doorways. Some are square, with an old, tiered design that has a regal feel to it. Other buildings have long, rectangular windows. Windows that you imagine let in the fragrant breeze of distant wildflower meadows when this city was above the waves. And though this city no longer has any people living in it, that does not mean life is not found there. Because everywhere you look, the city is alive with the beautiful animals of the ocean. Schools of fish cruise through the streets, rising and falling as they make their way around the buildings and rocks that have fallen in their way. The plants swaying along the walls and in the windows and doorways of the building add a natural, colorful layer to the city. 
you can see the motion of the waves within them as they sweep back and forth over the buildings. And alongside those plants, flecked around the surfaces of the city, there are more creatures to be found. You swim forward towards the edge of what appears to be an old home. Starfish are scattered across the surface, like stars twinkling in the night sky. They are an array of colors, each unique and beautiful in its own way. There's a bright pink one, a pale bubblegum one, a beige one with stripes of dark mahogany brown. There's even a purple and red starfish, so vibrant that for a moment it doesn't even seem real. You lean in close to them, admiring their beauty. Some of them remain steadfast on the surface of the walls, while others inch along, moving their arms and legs. The dots and ridges alongside their backs are even more incredible up close, like they've been painted by the ocean. It's hard to believe creatures as strange and wondrous as them could survive here. But you are eternally thankful that they can. You look down to see that they are not the only creatures who have made this city home. Along the sand, nestled against the edge of the building, next to a rock, a sea urchin sits, its sleek black spines almost make it look like a sculpture that's been placed there for decoration. There are a few more nearby, a group of them tucked away alongside some kelp and other undersea plants. You bid adieu to the starfish and sea urchins, continuing your journey through this beautiful underwater city. And with each turn you make, there are more and more stunning fish to be discovered. There are bright yellow fish, so bright they look as though they are trying to mimic the sun that is far above the waves. There are orange fish, like the color the setting sun paints the sky. They travel separately, weaving in between the other fish to create a moving art piece, a display of oranges, yellows, blues, and silvers, each one somehow more beautiful than the last. They look so at peace here as they meander through the waves with no particular goal in mind but to continue on. You press on through the city. Sometimes you allow your fingers to trace along the edges of the buildings. But as you press on swimming, the buildings become further and further apart. It seems that you are slowly reaching the outskirts of the city reaching the suburbia and farmland of years and years ago. There's one thing in particular that sticks out to you. One building that has an aura about it that makes a sense of peace wash over you. 
a building all by its lonesome, far away from the edges of the city. It is a simple stone building with a simple square roof, but one side of the building is covered in etchings. The wall that's covered in etchings is perhaps the most beautiful display of art that you've seen so far. The carvings are much like the carvings you saw atop that building in the center of the city. The bottom is a layer of flowers, poppies, sunflowers, and tulips, which stretch far up this mural of sorts. Even with the plants covering the stone and the years of wear, you can make them out almost perfectly. Then, in the center of the mural, there appears to be a depiction of a family, people standing arm in arm, while some people march along, smiles on their faces. Some of the people hold hands, while others seem to march to the beat of their own drum, and yet they are in perfect unison. Then, at last, you notice the top of this work of art. There lies a sun high in the sky, a bright, beautiful thing whose light you imagine this whole scene is basking in. You simply wade in the waves, taking in this beautiful mural for all that it is. It seems whoever lived in this home was an artist. Perhaps even the artist that carved the drawings on that other building all those years ago. And it looks as though the scene is a reflection of their family, of their life. The smiling faces, the individuals who all come together to be part of something even bigger than themselves. The thought alone brings a smile to your own face. It is a work of art that puts things into perspective. You swim to the window, taking in the scene before you. It is a simple, single-room home. In the far corner, you can make out what looks to be a hearth. You imagine for a moment how many meals were eaten around the hearth, how many stories were shared over its warmth. It is a tight space for a family, but judging by the mural and how you feel standing within the space, you know they were happy in spite of it. There's pottery in the corner, pottery that was probably their pride and joy. There was so much work and love put into every bit of this home and the life that was created here. Swimming in the doorway, you turn to get a look at the view from it. In the distance, the city can be seen. It's what you imagine the downtown area would be, stretching along what used to be the coast. You can picture the smoke rising from hearths all over the city. The sound of the hustle and bustle ringing out from the far distance. There were so many lives there, and they all were surely full of stories to tell. You imagine what this home was, tucked away from the city. It appears that it may have been a farm. 
perhaps a farm that grew flowers, flowers just like the ones depicted. There could have been sprawling fields of sunflowers, poppies, and tulips here, fields that stretched to the far horizon, spreading out from the edges of the city. You imagine there were trees, big oak trees that provided shade for the family to laugh and eat their meals under, big cypress trees that reached up to the rays of the sun, just like the plants beneath the water here appear to, when the waves are still and calm. It seems as though this place was just as peaceful all those years ago as it is now. You feel blessed to be able to be still in a place as beautiful as this, and it serves as a reminder of so many things, of how humans prosper from the same things no matter when or where they are born, how we crave the sunshine, how we look to the moon and stars for answers, and with eternal questions about how flowers refresh us and remind us of the beauty of life. And most of all, about how precious human connection really is. Feeling revitalized, you begin to make your way back to the city. You look back at that single room stone farmhouse, imagining what it may have looked like all those years ago. For a brief second, you swear you can see the children running through the meadow, ducking beneath the shade of oak trees. You swear you can see an artist etching the mural into the wall, casting pleased glances over their shoulder at their children every now and again. And as you swim back, into the city, you feel as lucky as that artist, because you are here, beneath the waves, breathing in the beautiful colors and sights around you. You are watching the brightly colored fish sail by, streaking a mosaic of blue, silver, orange and yellow through the cool ocean waves. You are watching plants sway on these ancient buildings, giving them new life even in the absence of the old. You are watching the starfish wiggle their little arms and legs, moving along in this slow, peaceful world. As you near the surface, you feel much lighter, invigorated by this experience, touched by it. When you step onto the sand of the beach and feel the sun really shine across your face, warming you to your core, you can't help but think about how beautiful this world is. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has helped guide you to a night of peaceful rest and sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome
Welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a sleepy train journey. Unlike any other on earth, we will wind along tracks that lace through beautiful countryside and pass through enchanted tunnels that will allow us to emerge into brand new worlds. Worlds of magic, of fantasy, and of tranquility. You find yourself standing at the train station on the kind of July day that doesn't seem like July. Dark gray clouds hang low over the sky, so heavy and imposing that they almost seem close enough to touch. Though it isn't the weather most people dream of, it gives the entire landscape before you a dreamy, sleepy atmosphere. The meadows that sprawl all the way to the horizon seem brighter somehow, their green grass popping with vibrancy against the dark backdrop of this stormy summer day. A thin mist hangs over the countryside, painting the views of the horizon with a gossamer that gives everything a dreamlike feel. You stand beneath an overhang as rain pours down from the edges of the roof above you. The sound of the steady drizzle dances against your ears, causing a wave of peace to wash over you. The rain seems to always encourage everyone to move slowly, to take the time to really look at the world around them and breathe in the aroma of the fresh, cool air. You take a deep breath as you stand beneath the overhang that shields you from the cool rain. You feel the fresh, invigorating breath fill your lungs and nourish your body and soul. On the breeze, you can smell the earthy, brilliant aroma of the rain. You can smell the fragrance of the rain-slicked flowers in the far distance, of the lupine and daisies and lavender and tulips, mixed with the calming scent of the damp soil and the cobblestone streets. It brings you a sense of peace that only a rainy day can. The station is empty aside from you. You assume that the rain has kept people at bay and urged them to spend a cozy day inside. But you intend on spending your rainy day somewhere even cozier, somewhere even more relaxing. You hear it before you see it. There's an echo, a rumbling ringing off the distant mountaintops from down the train tracks. Ever so slowly, the train chugs into view. A stack of smoke rises from the train as it moves toward your station, looking like something that's been plucked out of a fairy tale. Against the rainy, misty backdrop the mahogany sides of the train somehow look 
even more warm and inviting. The train rumbles to a stop before you. The dim flickering candlelights inside the train make all the compartments glow in otherworldly gold that radiates out into the fog surrounding it. For a moment, all you can do is stare up at the compartments, stunned and amazed by how utterly beautiful they are. Then, you hear an old wooden door slide open. A dapper man looks down at you, dressed in a slick, old-timey suit. A golden pocket watch hangs out of the front pocket of his dark navy suit. He pulls it out to take a look at it, adjusting his round wire-rimmed glasses to make sure he is getting the right time. He squints a bit and wiggles his trimmed gray mustache as he does some math in his head, surely calculating the journey ahead. Then he smiles down at you, a warm, encouraging smile that puts you completely at ease. He gestures with grandeur to the train. Good afternoon, my dear passenger. Are you boarding the Fantasy Express today? He asks, his voice warm and smooth as honey in the chilly air. You reach into your pockets unsure if you have a ticket for the ride ahead of you. But, to your surprise, you pull one out. It looks like something that was plucked out of the 1800s. A thick pulp paper ticket with calligraphy scrawled on it in thin, dark swoops. The man grins and takes the ticket from your hands with a polite bow. I see you will be joining us today. This mark here will show you our next destination. Keep it on your person at all times, please. The man takes a single hole punch and snips at the top corner of the ticket. But it is no ordinary cut he has made. The circle is glowing, like it's surging with electricity. A glow rings around the circle, kicking up tiny sparks that glow like the embers of a fire. You press a finger to it, wondering for a moment if you're dreaming, and are surprised to find that it isn't warm to the touch at all. The man gives you a reassuring smile and motions you up to the train. Welcome aboard the Fantasy Express. You step aboard, and as soon as you do, you can clearly see that the ticket is far from the only magical thing you will see today. Plush, cozy tables lie in the train compartment you have entered. A few scattered people sitting around, chatting about the journey ahead in low, intimate whispers and smiling at one another totally relaxed. A little girl gazes out the window in wonder, peeping up to ask her mother when she is going to see the magical creatures. And all around, the people sitting in the booths 
there is real magic happening. Tea kettles lift up into the air, pouring themselves into cups where spoons stir without anyone touching them. Sugar cubes dance across the table in winding little lines, leaping up into the cups of tea in graceful swoops. Trays full of fresh pastries scuttle down the aisle, pausing to give passengers a chance to grab themselves something to eat. A croissant, a donut, a crispy and sugary apple fritter, all of which are so fresh that warm steam is rolling off of them. The sweet aroma of that environment is enough to make you stop and stare for hours. But there's something that stops you from doing that. The ticket in your hand begins to move forward, gently guiding you toward your seat. You follow its tug as it leads you through the compartment into a row of private compartments. You turn toward one at your right, sliding aside a stained glass door that is adorned with stunning pictures. There are castles, unicorns, ocean waves, mermaids, a true world of fantasy and wonder. Inside, it is more cozy and inviting than you could ever imagine. The seats look like they've been handcrafted by a gifted artisan from the 1800s. They are made of a plush burgundy fabric that makes the rainy view outside the window even more beautiful. Rain cascades down over the large, thin window panes trailing down in winding drops that draw your eye outside. You take a seat in the booth and sink into it. You sigh with relief, surprised by just how comfortable it is. In front of you, a steaming kettle begins to shake slowly waking itself up and reporting for duty. You watch in awe as it lifts up into the air by magic and tilts itself, pouring warm tea into a mug on the counter in front of you. It levels off the tea and plops back down on the table returning to its place to await you needing a refill. From the far edge of the table, two sugar cubes shake themselves awake. They waddle across the table like two little ducklings before they climb the spoon, leading up to your tea and hop in disappearing into it. You take a long sip, breathing in the steam as you do so. It's a black tea, an earl grey. The warmth of the steam and the bergamot aromas of the tea itself relaxes you, urging you to sink deeper into your seat. Right after you take your first sip, the train begins to move. You smile as the train glides with ease along the tracks, starting slow and steady, 
until it eventually finds itself in a rhythm. The drone of the wheels and the engine and all the bits and pieces of the train is soothing background noise to your journey, ever present, reminding you that this is a good, safe place to just let go and relax. You gaze out the window at the rainy scene while you nurse your tea. But then, you notice something rather peculiar. Before you, the ticket that you received is beginning to glow brighter than before. It quivers slightly on the table as the hole that was punched in it expands into what looks like a castle. You pick up the ticket and inspect it, running your fingers over the new symbol that magic has carved there. Then you notice that the train is nearing a tunnel just ahead. You glide into the darkness of the tunnel leaving you with the soothing, steady sounds of the engine and wheels as they chug along. As soon as you find yourself in the darkness, you find yourself out of it. But you are no longer in a meadow in the countryside, and it is no longer raining. What lies before you is so otherworldly that you find yourself rubbing your eyes and blinking to see if it really is what it appears to be. There are rolling hills around you, emerald hills that are dotted with rock outcroppings. It looks like you've been dropped into a fantasy book taking place in Ireland or the moors of England. All around you, there are stone castles that seem to tower up into the sky. Stone castles with vibrant flags that flutter in the wind against the bright blue sky. You glide through a fantasy town, a town that is full of knights in shining armor atop noble white steeds. A woman in her armor looks down at you and smiles, tossing an intricate amber braid over her shoulder. It seems they are used to this train making its way through their world. Some women in regal, elegant dresses race through the town, giggling and laughing with one another, with books tucked under their arms. Their tulle and silk dresses seem to glisten in the sun, swishing with every step that they take. The manor cottages around you have thatched roofs and strips of dark wood laid across the beige exterior. Plants climb the edges of the buildings, otherworldly plants that you have never seen before. Some are a rainbow of colors, some change color as you pass them, and others glow, emitting flashes and sparkles that people pass by nonchalantly. The train swoops out of the village, leaving all the happy villagers behind. You find yourself gliding through the meadows and moors outside of the village, some people lounge on hand-spun wool blankets, indulging in picnics 
and playing music for one another as they dine on bread and cheese. Their life seems so simple here, so peaceful and happy and beautiful. To your right, a river flows alongside you. The colors of the river are breathtakingly gorgeous. It is so clear that you can see every rock, every fleck and speck on them that's shimmering in the sun, filtering in through the clean water. In other spots, the water is a milky blue, like a potion that's been poured into the gentle current. You think this world couldn't be more magical until you look up and see a creature standing at a bend in the river up ahead. The unicorn lifts its head to look at you, throwing its lush silver mane behind it as it does so. Its horn is a brilliant spiral of silver, blue, and purple, all calm colors that make you feel relaxed and at ease. Even at the sight of a creature this magnificent. The train slows slightly as you bend around the river near the unicorn. The unicorn gazes at you through the window pane, its blue eyes shining as it dips its head to you slightly. It takes one more sip of the cool mountain water. Then, slowly and gracefully, it turns and bounds away from the river towards the mountains in the distance. Every leap and bound it takes is more elegant and stunning than the next. Up ahead, you notice you are coming to yet another tunnel. You look down at the ticket, wondering what place you could be coming to next. It glows with that magical golden light, and then, slowly, grows yet again into a cutout of a flower. You turn your head slightly as you inspect the flower, wondering what that could possibly mean. The train glides into the tunnel. Once more, you're sitting in the darkness, listening to the soothing chug of the wheels, the engine, the gears. It's enough to almost lull you to sleep. And then, again, you emerge into a new world. A world that is vastly different from the one that you just left behind. It takes you a moment to realize exactly what's going on. Greenery towers all around you. Greenery that you don't particularly recognize. They almost look like trees, but the trunks are a beautiful green, and the canopy above doesn't appear to be made of leaves. Sunlight filters down through the greenery overhead, splashing across the train and your compartment in beautiful shimmering pieces. Finally, it all clicks into place. The things around you are not trees. They are flowers and plants, towering over you like trees. You look up in awe, marveling at the sight of normal, everyday garden flowers from this angle. 
A daisy overhead shields you from the sun, its white petals like an umbrella on this fine summer day. The moss of the forest floor looks otherworldly as well. It spreads to the base of the massive trees in the distance like a plush, soft carpet. The spirals of emerald and sage seem to be inviting you to lie down and relax, to watch the day go by. You continue winding through this world, marveling at everything from this new angle. And once more, the train begins to slow. Ahead of you, there appears to be a small, small village tucked beneath this canopy of flowers and plants, a village made of nature itself. There are cozy cottages crafted from acorns stacked and sewn together. To your left, there is a rustic-looking home that has siding made of the ridges from a pine cone. Curtains billow in the windows, curtains made of fallen flower petals, flower petals that look incredibly soft to the touch. There's a well in the center of the village, made of tiny pebbles with an acorn cap as the bucket in the center. It's the coziest, dreamiest village you have ever seen. You feel completely at peace as you look at it, and you feel even more at peace when the residents meander out of their homes to go about their daily chores. They look just like ordinary humans. If humans got everything they needed straight from nature, they wear clothes woven from leaves and flowers, dresses made of daisy petals, dress shirts made of sage and mint. You pop open your window to breathe in the world just outside the glass. The aroma of this tiny village causes a wave of peace to wash over you with every breath that you take. The air smells of the freshest forest you have ever set foot in. You can smell the earthy soil, the loam, the gentle perfume of the flowers, but mostly, you can smell the herbs. The fragrance of the mint, rosemary, and sage gives a spice to the air, an invigorating spice that soothes your entire body and mind. You sink deeper into the seat as you breathe more and more deeply. Up ahead, once again, you notice a tunnel. You smile, ready to see what else this ride has crafted for you. You reach forward and take the thick ticket into your hands, tracing your fingers longingly over the letters before you. Slowly, the hole that's been punched out yet again begins to glow. It transforms from a flower into a ship. You run your finger over the ship, unsure of exactly what it means. You glide into the dark tunnel, and when you emerge out the other side, you find yourself in a world of blue. You are sailing over the ocean in the train. It appears that the tracks 
are mere inches from the surface, causing a spray of water to kick up around you as the train chugs along. It feels like you are flying over the water, like you're walking on it. There is no land to be seen around you, which makes this unique experience feel even more magical. It's a cloudy day here, the kind of cloudy day that is welcome on the sea. The sun flickers in and out of the white, cottony clouds, providing pockets of warmth and shade. The ocean around you is surprisingly still, glistening with whatever sunlight makes its way down to the waves. The ocean around you is a mosaic of blues, cerulean, cyan, turquoise, cobalt, and azure. Such a brilliant mix of blues that you would think Mother Nature was a painter. Your gaze drifts up, and what you see before you is something you never thought you would see in your lifetime. A pirate ship sails just before you, cutting through the waves with ease. Its white sails billow in the salty sea breeze. You pop open your window even wider just to see what it's like beyond the glass. The scent of the sea makes you think of warm summer days on the coast. It's salty, invigorating, relaxing. You can smell hints of the shore on the breeze, pine trees dotting the rocky coastline, sleepy coastal town bakers making chowder, and fresh rolls peppered with sea salt, sand-lined beaches glistening in the sun. You close your eyes for a moment just to breathe it in more deeply. When you open your eyes, you see the pirate ship before you, turning toward the distant horizon. The crew rise from the cabin to give the train a wave. Some pirates hang onto the rope ladder leading up to the lookout spot. Others pop out of portholes, and some lean down from the deck, happy to see you. Up ahead, you notice yet another tunnel coming up. When you look down at your ticket, you aren't entirely surprised to see the hole glowing and transforming into a picture of a train. When you emerge out of the tunnel, the windows around you are slicked with the peaceful, slow rain. Ahead of you, the train station that you left from awaits. You smile as you gather your things, nourished and soothed by the sights you saw on the Fantasy Express. You put the ticket in your pocket, knowing that you can visit this train anytime you wish. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, Sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, 
and tonight I will be your guide as we travel to a lush, beautiful forest where we will spend a year relaxing and soaking in the seasons as we renovate a cabin home together. It's spring when you first drive down the long, winding path into the woods on the far outskirts of the city. It's far enough away to be secluded, far enough away from you to almost forget that the city and the obligations within it exist altogether. The directions that you've printed out on a coffee-stained piece of paper crinkle in soft hands as you turn down a long dirt road, a dirt road named Lilac Lane. This time of year, so early in the spring that the trees have just begun to blossom and fill the air with a splash of color. The lilacs have not bloomed, but on the sides of the road, you can see the large lilac bushes swaying slightly in the breeze that your car swooshes over them. They are rounded bushes with large, glossy leaves. And this time of year, you can't stop yourself from imagining what they'll look like in just a few weeks' time. You glance down at the directions, directions that were typed out to you by one of your relatives who has passed this property down onto you in her old age. She had no use for it any longer, she told you. No desire to make the changes necessary to turn the old cabin into a home. But there's something inside of you pulling you towards the property. Something inside you that aches to take something rough around the edges and turn it into a home. In messy handwriting, the directions tell you to turn left at the second willow tree on Lilac Lane. You're so transfixed by the forest around you that you almost miss the first and then almost miss the second. You come to a stop just after the second willow tree, right where a long, dirt driveway meets the meandering dirt road that seems to only lead deeper and deeper into the beautiful forest. You smile to yourself as you turn down the driveway, and as you begin to drive down it, you feel like you're being transported into a fairy tale. The driveway is carved out of the trees and the forest like a tunnel. Overhead, birches, oaks, and maples form a canopy, giving you only the briefest glimpses of the bright blue sky that's beyond them. Light filters in through the trees in breathtaking rays that sparkle in the midst of the dim yet inviting forest. You drive slowly down the road, not only to soak in the stunning nature of the surrounding, but to guide yourself around the shallow holes and puddles that have formed all the way down the road. In the forest, you see glimpses of the adorable animals 
that have already claimed their residency here. A bunny darts behind your car as you pass through a grove of oak trees. It stops in the middle and seems to give you a friendly look through your rear view window. A welcome to the neighborhood that is like a balm on many nerves that are frayed within you. Far off, you think you see the glimpse of a doe and her fawn. There's a speckle of white on a soft fur coat, and then, seconds later, nothing. You smile to yourself, knowing that it means their camouflage is surely working. As you continue on, the canopy around you gradually begins to widen. Ahead of the road, you can see the ends of the trees, where they open up, giving way to a large clearing. When you emerge into the clearing, the sunlight washes over you, giving you a grand entrance to your brand new property. And my, what a gorgeous property it is. The cabin sits in the center of the clearing. All around, thick woods stretch as far as the eye can see. On the right side of the cabin, a trickling creek laces through the countryside. All around it, tiny white flowers have cropped up, soaking in the nourishment of the water. The grounds around the cabin are awash in a wave of color, brought on by the spring bloom. Though it hasn't been tended to in quite some time, daffodils, tulips, and forget-me-nots paint the grass in a mosaic of nature's finest colors. With every gust of wind, you find yourself breathing in the fragrant aroma of spring's finest wildflowers. Intertwined with the grass, blankets of moss are laid across the ground. They give the entire clearing a fairy tale look that simply takes your breath away. Every part of you wants to lie down in the moss, to soak in the scenery around you as the wildflowers rustle in the breeze beside you. But there is something else calling your attention. The cabin itself. It's a breathtaking feat of engineering. An old A-frame coated in windows on the front side. A deck rests on the front giving you never-ending views of the stunning forest and creek beside you. It is a dream, something that almost seems too beautiful and perfect to exist. And yet, it is rough around the edges. As you get closer, it's impossible to deny that the cabin needs a bit of work. The roof is cloaked in layers of lichen and moss, some sprouting flowers and plants that reach up to the spring sun overhead. You know it's been ages since the roof has been replaced. Perhaps since it was first built. The brown exterior paint is chipping, as is the paint 
on the deck. And as you walk across the deck, you can see where repairs will need to be made. It creaks and whines beneath your feet, only adding to the atmosphere of the forest around you. You approach the front door, a pop of orange that rivals the brightness of the wildflowers peppered across the lawn. You glance down at the directions your relative has given you once more. The key is under the flower pot. They read in your relative's crooked, charming handwriting. At your feet, several flower pots wait for you. You smile to yourself at the lack of specifics she's included and go through the flower pots one by one, lifting one after the other until you finally come across a large iron key. It's ancient. Surely the original key to the house, and it is a nice weight in your hands. You slide the key into the lock. Excitement buzzes in you, curiosity at what lies beyond the door and in the house itself, a house you've only heard stories about. With the click of the lock on the door, you know your real journey is about to begin. When you step inside, a feeling of serenity washes over you at once. The home smells a bit like childhood vacations, like cabins in the woods like camps you visited on lakes. It's the smell of books sitting on shelves, waiting for the next vacationer to pick them up and read the faded print within them. It's the smell of board games piled on coffee tables with long forgotten scores scribbled on the notepads inside them. It's the smell of homemade quilts and crocheted blankets that have been keeping members of your family warm for generations. It smells like home, and as you step inside, you have no doubt that you will be able to make it your home. The living space is incredibly open giving all areas views through those incredible floor-to-ceiling windows that cover the front of the A-frame. To your right, a cozy vintage kitchen rests in the bright light streaming in through the old windows. There are beige linoleum floors with vague patterns etched onto them, and appliances that actually bring a smile to your face. The stove, built into the cabinets rather than sitting on the floor, is an avocado green that pops against the old wood cabinets. The fridge, too, is vintage, and the sink is rather but certainly something that was replaced more recently than the other appliances. You tiptoe around the kitchen, glancing inside cabinets and trying to come up with an idea for the space. The linoleum pops and crackles under your feet, something that gives you hope there may be some more beautiful flooring beneath it. You have no doubt you can turn this cozy little kitchen 
into an updated dreamy cabin kitchen that will be perfect for your new home. The main living area where the couches and the dining table reside are blanketed in a bright orange carpet straight out of the 70s. You can't help but smile and shake your head at the choice that was made. Once more, you're hopeful that there is something more elegant beneath it. The original floors, perhaps. Something a bit more neutral and neat. A large fireplace lines the left wall. It reaches all the way up to the ceiling, as much as a centerpiece of the room as the windows themselves are. It's made of stone for a true cabin feel. You imagine yourself lighting a fire in it and relaxing on the couch. You make your way up the floating staircase that's also wrapped in orange carpeting. Upstairs, you find the bedroom. It's a loft-style room, giving you those views out of the windows, as well as out windows behind the bed. It's a cozy, very usable space that ignites some excitement within you. You truly can picture yourself sleeping here, making a life here, watching the seasons outside the window feels like it will be a dream. You head back downstairs, taking note of the changes you'd like to make. To your surprise, the bathroom hardly needs any work. The only thing tickling at the edge of your mind, begging to be heard, is the desire deep within you to put a clawfoot tub in. You head outside, locking the adorable cabin behind you. Unable to fight your desire to lounge in the moss and the flowers any longer, you plop down on the soft bed. The moss beneath you welcomes you with a light spring encouraging you to relax and let go of any tension you've been carrying, any restrictions you have put on yourself, whether you're aware of them or not. You soak in the feeling of the sun on your skin for a long moment. The breeze winds through the flowers and gently brushes across your face, encouraging you to sink deeper and deeper into a state of peaceful relaxation. You can smell the freshness of these flowers, these flowers which have brought the first touch of color to the world after a long white winter. You breathe them in deeply. Just as you do, you hear the sound of light hooves nearby. You look up from your resting place to see the doe and her fawn approaching the stream that's laced through the forest. The doe gives a cautious look around, her fluffy ears flicking in the morning air. She nods to her fawn, seemingly giving her an okay to drink from the stream. The clumsy little fawn bounces to the edge of the water and dips her muzzle down into the cool current. She takes long sips, her tail and ears flicking as she does so. 
Their spirits are so gentle, their moves so delicate, that it fills you with a sense of serenity unlike anything else you've ever felt. You watch the mother and her little fawn for quite some time before they actually spot you. But to your surprise, they don't flee. The doe looks at you, frozen in a ray of beautiful sunlight bleeding down through the trees. She cants her head to the side just the slightest, and eventually they bound off, heading deeper into the forest where they can live in peace and harmony. You lie back down in the moss and pull a journal out of your bag. One by one, you list the changes you'd like to make to the property. Changes that you'd like to get done by winter and have no doubt you will be able to do. It takes a few weeks for you to gather the supplies, the furniture, and the inspiration you need to transform the cabin into your home. As you drive toward the property with them piled into the back of a beat-up, charming truck, you are immediately aware that it is no longer spring. Because when you turn down Lilac Lane, the quaint dirt road is ablaze with the soft, purple glow of lilacs in full bloom. They line the edges of the road, some of them even towering over the car and brushing against the roof as you drive at a snail's pace down the road. The lilacs simply take your breath away. They are every shade of purple, pink, and white that you've ever seen. The blossoms are so small that as you drive, some of them detach and pepper the road like a layer of confetti. And, indeed, today does feel like a celebration of sorts. You roll down the window, breathing in the scent of the lilacs. It almost brings tears to your eyes, the freshness of it, the sweetness of it. It makes you think of childhood days lounging in the grass with a fresh cup of lemonade at your side. The driveway leading to the cabin has changed as well. The canopy overhead is even thicker now, flourishing with leaves and birds' nests and animals' homes for the season. The puddles have dried up, and you are left with a peaceful drive down the driveway to the home you've come to love so much. The wildflowers that were once blooming on the front lawn have transformed. Daisies, black-eyed Susans, and yarrow paint the yard in a swath of bright yellow with tiny flecks of black. Along the creek, lupines have sprung to life, their purple buds reaching up and outward like a fountain of life. You head inside, mingling on the porch for only an instant to breathe in the aroma of the spring air. There's a touch of humidity in it, and with that, the fragrant freshness of the forest seems even more lovely than usual. Inside, you know what your first order of business is. 
You look down at the carpet, a tool in hand to rip them up, and see what wonders lie underneath. You cross your fingers as you make the first cut, and your heart leaps when you see what's beneath the 70s carpet. There's a hardwood floor, rich, dark hardwood floor in a herringbone pattern that makes you feel like swooning. It's caked with layers of dust, with particles of fabric and material that were buried beneath the carpet long, long ago. But you've never been so happy to see something like this before. You open the windows of the house, allowing the summer breeze to sweep through the room as you work throughout the day. You truly feel like you are living inside and outside. It feels like you could reach out and touch the forest absolutely any time that your heart desired. You spend the morning and afternoon peeling away the carpet bit by bit. It's a cathartic act, one that is soothing and comforting to watch. You slice the carpet, then peel it back. Slice the carpet, then peel it back. It's like peeling a sticker of a fresh piece of fruit, seamless and satisfying. You lug the old carpet and kitchen linoleum outside to be thrown away. And when you re-enter, you are met with your first image of the floors in all their glory. The pattern of the hardwood makes you breathless. It isn't flooring. It's a work of art in every way imaginable. You grab a bottle of hardwood floor cleaner and get to work. With every swipe of your cloth, the dingy floor is transformed into something alive something that makes the whole room glow. The richness of the wood is revealed, and though it takes you all day to make your way across the floor, you feel a sense of accomplishment and belonging. As you work, you can hear a roofer working on repairing the old roof overhead. Though you aren't talking to one another, it almost feels like you are making music together. You brush, brush, brush the floor, and she crack, crack, cracks new shingles into place on your roof. There's unity in your actions. Two people working on improving something that is already amazing. When the afternoon finally sweeps across the property, the entire room is bathed in an orange glow. You sit on your beautiful hardwood floors, exhausted and blissful. When you've soaked in their beauty enough, you take a moment to sit by the creek. You listen to the creek peacefully bubbling as it meanders through the forest. And in the distance, you see something that fills your heart with joy. The same fawn and mother, only this time, the fawn is much larger and has clearly gotten a better handle of its coordination. You smile as you watch it dreamily make its way across the grass, its mother following behind with quick, light steps. 
for the whole summer. That is your routine. You arrive in the early morning to do the usual work. With the floors done, you move on to bringing in furniture and appliances. You decide to leave the avocado-colored appliances, but know that painting the cabinets is in order. You replace the sink with a large farm sink on a rainy summer afternoon. With the windows open, you truly feel like you're in a novel. The rain drizzles over the brand new roof and plop plops into the grass below you as you work on replacing the sink. And then, before you know it, autumn is upon you. And it is perhaps the most beautiful autumn you've ever seen. The forest is alive in a way that is completely different from summer and spring. The leaves awash in an array of orange, red, brown, and gold. As the sunlight catches them, it makes the entire tree glow as if it is beautifully ablaze. As you drive down the winding driveway, mushrooms sway on the side of the road from the movement of your car. Ferns you've never seen before pop up all through the forest, inviting critters to snack on them or store them for winter. And for autumn, you only have a few specific things in mind for the home. With the floor set, the roof and deck repaired, the appliances functioning, now you have your mind on the aesthetics, on things that will make it feel more cozy. One fall afternoon, you line the floor of the kitchen with a drop cloth. As usual, all the windows are open. You soak in the aroma of autumn of the leaves piling up on the soft, cold ground, of mushrooms popping up from the earth, of fresh apples that have fallen from the apple trees at the edge of the forest, begging to be made into a pie. You breathe in that soothing scent as you stain the cabinets a deeper, more vintage brown. With every stroke of your brush, you watch as the cabinets are transformed. You smile to yourself as you work. Vintage autumn music plays out from a radio you've placed above the fireplace. A fireplace that will be ready to light any day now. You spend the rest of autumn tidying up the home, painting, and preparing it for winter. There's one thing on your to-do list tugging at you, begging for your attention. And as more and more leaves fall from the trees, you have a small concern it won't get done this year. But then, one day, you find it, exactly what you're looking for. At an antique mall down the road, a gorgeous clawfoot tub is for sale. Thrilled, you offer to buy it, and the antique dealer delivers it to your home. With some skilled friends on that particularly chill fall afternoon, you get the clawfoot tub set up in the bathroom right in front 
of the beautiful window that looks out into the secluded wilderness. You feed your friends with fine drinks and wonderful autumn treats, soups, stews, fresh homemade bread, and apple desserts from the nearby trees. When they go home, you stand and look at the cabin with a smile on your face. You have no doubt now it is ready for winter. Satisfied with all your hard work, you run a bubble bath and slip into the tub that you've longed for since the moment you first walked into the house. As you sink into the warm bubbles, feeling accomplished and full of love, something outside the window catches your attention. It's the fawn and her mother. Only the fawn is no longer a fawn. Her flecked white coat has been replaced by a tawny adult coat, a sign of the time that has peacefully passed for all of you in the forest. As you lounge back, admiring the beautiful deer, a single snowflake drifts down from the clouds overhead. You smile to yourself, knowing in your heart that this will be a perfect home for winter a perfect home for the rest of your life. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful relaxation. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we descend through the mysterious, mist-shrouded autumn woods on a calm, sleepy train ride that will take us around the world. Together, we will explore how Halloween and other similar holidays are celebrated by different cultures, places, and people. On a cool, relaxed autumn train ride together, we will find peace and comfort in these tranquil traditions, all while getting closer to a night of relaxing sleep. It's a beautiful autumn afternoon the sun has just begun to set over the thick forest surrounding you, and the landscape is aglow in light that is so breathtaking you feel like you have stepped into a painting. The forest is a sea of stunning colors, a sea of scarlet, of gold, of orange and amber, a sea that is shimmering and moving with every slight breeze that dances across it. With every gust, the leaves flutter, and with some gusts, leaves fall. They cascade to the ground in bright plumes, falling down like big, slow flakes of snow that are taking their sweet time on their way back down to earth. And behind those leaves, it looks as though the sky is reflecting the forest. As the sun sets, the sky is painted in a mosaic of warm tones, of peaceful pink, of deep amber, of fiery red and rich, rich gold. It's
It's like a heavenly artist has spilled their palette on the landscape before you, and you find yourself soaking up every bit of it with utter glee. Though it feels like you are worlds away from people and cities in a forest as beautiful as this one, after a brief moment of taking in the surrounding vista, you can tell that you are not. Behind you, there is a thick line of trees, colorful deciduous trees, and a line of cedars that nearly obstruct your view of the town that is just behind you. Peering through the beautiful, lush foliage, you can just barely see the street. The street is alive and buzzing in the glory of Halloween. Jack-o'-lanterns glow on each porch, their homemade smiles reminding you of peaceful childhood days and sweet, sweet memories. As the sun has just begun to set, the children of the town have just started to pour out onto the streets. Some of them zip by in their costumes with huge smiles on their faces laughing and telling jokes to one another, seeing who can possibly get the most candy. Then there are others, younger children who stroll along in a daze, gazing at all the new decorations in awe. They do not know it, but they're making wonderful memories that will last a lifetime, that will make them smile every time they see a pumpkin or smell air that reminds them of this night. You turn away from the street, allowing everyone to continue with their festivities. And when you turn away, you notice something rather incredible about the forest clearing that you hadn't noticed before. There is a path lined with candles lacing through the forest ahead of you, leading you deeper into it. The candles are small tea lights and candle holders that are a beautiful range of colors. They mimic the leaves above. Each candle holder alternates as a different color. There is amber, golden, orange, and red, each color somehow flickering even brighter than the last. You admire them for a long moment, wondering how they found themselves in a strange place like this. So, you do what the beautiful candles and the forest itself are beckoning you to do. You continue ahead, following the path with slow, dreamy steps. You listen to the crunch of the leaves underneath you, a crunch that is comforting a crunch that tells you that you are absolutely heading down the correct path. You walk along the winding dirt and leaf path, rounding around an old, forgotten stone wall that is coated in thick, beautiful moss. You can tell there are stories behind the wall, that perhaps once, it was a wall that was covered in big jack-o'-lanterns that looked over the town on the spookiest night of the year. Once you've rounded the stone wall, you find yourself standing underneath the awning of a small, 
quaint building. A stone building that, much like the wall, is blanketed in moss. Moss that has surely protected it for dozens of years. Old advertisements and posters still line the inside of the awning. You run your fingers over the crinkled paper with faded paint, and as you do, the reality of where you're standing dawns on you. The advertisements are all for trains, and the one that your fingers are dancing over now is for a particularly interesting train. Writing across the top reads, For one night only, the Spirit Steam Train. You furrow your brow as you gaze at the picture, wondering what kind of train would run for one night only. And then, you hear it. In the distance, the unmistakable whine of a train whistle you step out from the awning, and only then do you see the train tracks below you. They seem long forgotten. Plants grow over them, and ferns have made their comfortable bed across the iron. And yet, you hear the train growing closer. Above the lush autumn leaves, you can see the smokestack advancing closer and closer to you as the train chugs along the tracks. It emerges through the wall of orange autumn trees like it is emerging from a dream. It looks exactly like a train from the 1800s, a black and red steam engine that somehow looks brand new. It rolls to a slow stop in front of you. You watch in awe and disbelief, hardly able to grasp that this train has emerged and that you are the only one on the tracks. The door pops open, letting out a puff of warm, fragrant air with it warm, fragrant air that smells of pumpkins, cinnamon, and apples. You're so delighted and surprised by the warm gust of fragrant air that for a moment you don't even notice the kindly woman smiling down at you. She adjusts her wire-rimmed glasses and extends her hand with a wave of familiarity. Ticket, my dear, she says, her voice as warm and smooth as honey. You tell the woman that you have no ticket. She shakes her head and grins as she chimes. Check your pocket, dear. You reach into your fluffy coat pocket. You're surprised as you produce a ticket. A ticket that is in the shape of a pumpkin. The woman takes it with a grateful nod and punches the ticket, welcoming you aboard the train. Walking into this train is the most surreal experience you have ever had. The interior of the train is a stunning rich mahogany. The booths themselves are large, with seats lined with fine red velvet. The entire car is awash in Halloween and autumn decorations. Pumpkins and candles seem to dot every free space and there are several children donning costumes all around the train. You take a seat at the end of the train where a cozy booth awaits you. 
A cup of steaming apple cider sits on the table, its steam trailing up into the air in sweet little plumes. You take a sip of it, savoring its delicious taste across your tongue. As soon as you lean back in your chair, the train begins to move. The metallic groaning and grunting of the engine and the gears and the wheels is somehow comforting. There's a rhythm to it, a rhythm that tells you that you are in good hands. You gaze out the window as the breathtaking autumn landscape drifts by. The train is slow at first, so slow that you can trace the outline of each and every leaf with your eyes. But soon, the train picks up speed. The sea of beautiful warm tones becomes a soothing blur as you continue along mesmerized by the beauty of the vista before you. Up ahead, you can see a tunnel carved out in a large granite mountain. Vines and moss hang from the entrance of the tunnel, telling you that it has been long since anyone has traversed this beautiful and wild path. As the train plunges into the darkness of the tunnel, you do not feel afraid. In fact, you feel more comforted. The sound of the wheels and engine and gears echoes a bit more now, rocking you deeper into rest like a sweet, sweet lullaby. When you emerge out of the tunnel, an entirely new vista lies before your eyes. Sunset has just begun to splash over the landscape. And my, what a landscape it is. Rolling hills stretch as far as your eye can see. They are a brilliant mix of colors, some a vibrant green, others a splash of red, of orange, of brown. The grass is also there. It looks much like the autumn leaves you have just left behind in a different landscape. This is farmland, and this isn't in the Americas or Asia or Africa. It becomes fairly clear. In the far distance, you can see long-forgotten castles growing moss and overgrowth between ancient oak trees. They loom over the farmland, keeping a watchful eye on it and its inhabitants. There are rows of grapes and vines, wineries that pepper the countryside, and, ahead of you on the tracks, there is a small town. A town that was clearly made hundreds of years ago, and has remained the way it was created since then. You glide into the town ever so slowly on the tracks, moving along cobblestone streets and taking long, winding turns up hills that are lined with colorful houses and houses made of stone. One thing you notice is that every window has a red candle burning in it. Some appear to have just been lit, and others are being lit as you glide on past. You are in the countryside of Italy, and it isn't really Halloween. It is All Saints' Day, or Ogni Santi in Italian. In Italy, 
Many people celebrate a modern rendition of Halloween just like several other countries. However, along with Halloween, they have another tradition that they often observe. You glide to the edge of town where, in the dim light of the setting sun, a cemetery is illuminated in the glow of several candles. Old speckled and cracked gravestones are bathed in vibrant chrysanthemums. The golden and red flowers seem to mimic the sunset that is splashing across the land, giving it life and adding more beauty to this already breathtaking landscape. On Onyesanti, Italians celebrate the lives of their loved ones who have passed on. In honor of them, they light a red candle in the windowsill at sunset, a lumino. They visit cemeteries and lay chrysanthemums on tombstones in honor of their loved ones, offering the flowers as a gift to them. Children are given gifts and treats as a symbol of gifts from their loved ones who have passed on. One important aspect of the holiday is fostering a connection between the living and those who are not, a show of unity and interconnectedness with each other and our love that perseveres. You continue on through the cemetery. You can't help but notice how many families are smiling with each other, enjoying one another's company as they reflect on the past and look forward to the future together. As you continue through the rest of town, you notice that the streets are alive with people, children and adults alike, feast on roasted chestnuts, the first time in the season. They savor the rich, nutty flavor as they bustle from home to home, sharing stories and cherishing each other's company. But Italy is not the only place that celebrates November 1st and 2nd in this fashion. Up ahead, you see another tunnel. As you approach it, you bid farewell to this beautiful Italian town and all the joy and peace that can be found within it. As you enter the tunnel, you close your eyes, really listening to the sound of the metal creaking, of the rhythmic chug, 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 of the train's wheels echoing off the edges of the tunnel. When you emerge, you emerge into a world of color and instantly you know where you are. You are in Mexico and it is El Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. El Dia de los Muertos is a two-day celebration where people in Mexico and Latin America honor their loved ones. You glide by stunning adobe homes, homes that are flourishing with plants, with papel picado that are wrapped from building to building, fluttering in the wind and crisscrossing the streets with beautiful swaths of color. Through the windows of the homes, you can see several altars glowing proudly and brightly. On El Dia de los Muertos, many families create altars to honor their deceased family members. The altars are aglow with the light of candles, with flowers, and with sweets and foods that are offerings to the family members. 
who are said to be able to visit on the day of the dead. You glide by a cemetery on the edge of town, one that is colorful, much like the Italian cemetery was. Trails of flower petals crisscross the soft earth, and families smile and eat snacks in each other's company. Though there are images of those who have passed on seemingly everywhere, it is not a day of mourning. It is a day of celebration and connection, a day where families can reflect and learn lessons from their loved ones. Up ahead once more, you spot a tunnel. You gaze at the stunning landscape of Mexico, at the lush forests in the background, at the cozy, colorful town full of laughter and joy, at the decorations made just for loved ones, and you smile. Another beautiful tradition, one that fills you with a sense of peace and belonging. You enter the tunnel once more. You close your eyes, really soaking in the sounds around you. The chug, chug, chug that tells you that you are safe. That tells you that you are approaching something wonderful, something to be enjoyed. When you emerge again, you are in an entirely different landscape, one that you weren't expecting, but one that makes you smile. Instantly, you are well aware of where you are. The neon lights and distinct mix of traditional Japanese buildings and sleek modern ones is a dead giveaway that you are in Tokyo. And though Tokyo is often busy, today it is even more so. In Japan, Halloween is very much an adult holiday. Teens and adults celebrated by dressing in elaborate costumes and going out on the town. Some attend parties, some go to events, and many go to the Kawasaki Halloween Parade, an event unlike any other. You glide through the parade, gazing in awe at the intricate and stunning costumes. Everyone is smiling and laughing, having a good time with each other as they let loose and enjoy what the holiday has to offer. There are floats that have to be approved many months in advance. Floats of traditional Japanese folklore and floats of modern horror and spooky characters. The streets are alive with people and delicious food that makes your mouth water. You take in each costume, feeling more relaxed and inspired with each one that you see. You imagine people curled up at home by their kotatsu, working diligently on their costumes, costumes that they may only wear once, but costumes that will bring them so much joy. It's amazing seeing the costumes out in the world. Amazing seeing so many people connect over them. The train continues on, gliding out of the center of town. Gradually, you make your way into the Japanese countryside. Lush farmland and rice fields stretch to the mountains in the far distance. Hillsides coated in forest seem to beckon to you, reminding you exactly why Japan has so much beautiful 
and intricate folklore. Up ahead, carved into the side of the mountain, you see it, yet another tunnel waiting for you. You gaze back over the Japanese countryside as the sun sets behind Tokyo in the far distance. You feel a sense of peace wash over you. It's comforting that there is beauty spread across the world. Such rich beauty from Mexico to Italy all the way to Japan. The darkness of the tunnel welcomes you like a warm blanket. You sail through, listening to the comforting chug, chug, chug of the wheels, the gears, the engine. You take a sip of the drink before you, a drink that brings back so much warmth. When you emerge, you find yourself back in the town you started in, only this time you are starting from the far side of town, and this time Halloween is in full swing. Children run along the sidewalk in their costumes, swinging bags and pumpkin baskets full of candy. They excitedly show one another their haul and laugh with each other, proudly proclaiming how much candy they got from the last house or how much the owner liked their costume. Parents trail behind them, smiling from ear to ear as they watch their children make wonderful memories. You glide through the peaceful suburbs full of all that joy and find yourself riding by a farm. A corn maze stretches into the far distance. You see people laughing and clinging to each other and their maps as they enter, hoping that somehow they'll be able to find a way out. Others make their way over to the apple trees with wooden baskets. They climb up, gathering apple after apple with the help of one another. You know the apples are going home to become a pie, to be plopped into a bowl for bobbing for apples, or maybe to be sprinkled with cinnamon and baked just as they are. You can smell the air just looking outside, the freshness of it, the nostalgia and mystery and excitement in that beautiful autumn air. It is a time of reflection, of discovery, of peace and comfort, a time to prepare for winter on the horizon, a time to think about the bounty of the earth and all that she provides for us. Soon, the train rumbles to a stop at the station you started from. Once more, you are swimming in the sea of autumn leaves. Only this time, you have a much fuller picture of the celebrations that are out there, of what Halloween and similar holidays stand for. You exit the train, taking a long drink of the fresh air, and with that long sip of air, you feel renewed and ready for whatever is to come. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.